afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Prue Adams, and I'm your host for this first in a series of virtual information sessions for the Winston Churchill Trust. Uh, it is super exciting as the fellowships kick, kick off again after last year's absence due to the pandemic, of course. We have more than 160 people attending from every state and territory at the moment. Um, as you know, this session focuses on agriculture and food production. And we have two brilliantly informative and engaging speakers in Dr. Hazel McTavish-West and Tim Roach. Uh, but first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And given we are speaking across the nation, there are many groups in which we pay our respects to elders past and present. I'm delivering this presentation from Ghana land and I pay my personal respects to the Ghana people. So before we hear from our two fellows, the Chief Executive Officer of the Churchill Trust, Adam Davey, uh, will give a brief overview of the role of the trust and the potentially life-changing part it can play for the successful recipients of fellowships. So it's over to you, Adam. Thanks, Prue, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I'm speaking to you from Canberra, which is Ngunnawal and Nambri land, and, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, Australia's First Nations people and pay my respect to Elders past, present and future, and also um, particularly to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who've tuned in. Um, I would like to mention we've got quite a strong cohort of uh, First Nations Churchill Fellows and we're building that network. And so um, that's something you, you might look forward to being part of if you apply and you're successful. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the very difficult times we're living in uh, with COVID and, and the pandemic, uh, both here in Australia and globally. Uh, there's been a lot of disruption and uncertainty and suffering. And, you know, I hope you're attending this session with a positive mindset and a hopeful outlook. Um, if you made it here today, you're one step closer to becoming a Churchill Fellow. So I'm going to share my screen um, with you now for a few slides. Now, one of the uh, things I'm often asked, and it's a good question, is where does the money come from for Churchill Fellowships? And that's you know, quite a sensible question. When Winston Churchill resigned as British Prime Minister in 1955, he was aged 80. He'd served under five reigning monarchs. He'd survived three wars. He'd been a writer, an historian, a journalist, a painter. Uh, he'd won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. And there was a widespread desire to honour Sir Winston and capture some of the essence of his public service, his inspiration, his intellect and, and his humour. Uh, he wasn't perfect and, you know, we acknowledge that. And you can read some insightful essays on our website that explore Churchill through a contemporary lens. But he was someone who believed readily that anything was possible if you put your mind to it. And that's... You know, one of the greatest things about Churchill Fellows is that they can achieve anything when they put their mind to it. And on Churchill Memorial Sunday, which is 28th of February, 1965, a door-to-door -door, uh, appeal was held in Australia and over 220,000 Australians, with a lot of support from the RSL, uh, went around Australia and collected money and we raised about 2.2 million pounds. It's about $4 million equivalent. And that money has been invested carefully and, and we use the earnings of that money to pay for fellowships each year. And we award around 100 fellowships at the cost of something in the order of $3 million a year. And we do have some uh, sponsors and donors as well. They help contribute to the uh, finances um, of the trust and so we can award Churchill fellowships. So that's just a little, little bit of history. There's, there's lots more on our website if you're interested in that. And I think it's worth being a bit interested um, in Winston Churchill if you're applying for a Churchill Fellowship. Another question that I'm often asked is what are the attributes of a Churchill Fellow? And as you can see on the slide there, I think there's no question that Churchill Fellows are invariably talented people and, and you know, they're the sort of people that will go the extra mile and are really committed to making a difference in their community or in their field, um, in their employment, wherever it might be, they're, they're really committed to making a difference. And, you know, Churchill Fellows do share similar traits uh, to Sir Winston Churchill, like passion, drive and determination. Now, one of the things that I think is excellent about Churchill Fellowships is that they 
um, are prestigious and unique, and they are an opportunity that's open to Australian small walks of life. So it's not an academic scholarship, and it's not a funding grant. Uh, it's not just an overseas trip. It's the start of a lifelong journey to make a contribution to Australia. Now, a Churchill Fellowship does not need to comprise formal research. You can learn new skills, you can build networks and observe best practice in your chosen field. And a fellowship um, is for overseas travel only and must be between four to eight weeks and taken in one continuous journey. And I'll talk a little bit about some changes we've made very, very recently to that in a moment. We've awarded nearly 4,500 Churchill Fellowships since 1965. And as I mentioned before, we try to award around 100 each year. And Churchill Fellows travel across the globe on the widest range and depth of topics and bring back to this country information, networks, projects, products, ideas, and innovation um, that help make Australia even stronger. So to be eligible, um, you must be an Australian citizen or as of this year, uh, a permanent resident and aged over 18 years of age. The ability to travel overseas is of course essential um, and we can provide support for you if you uh, might, for example, um, need a carer or some other assistance. Uh, some new changes that we've just introduced include um, virtual research being an option for people who cannot travel due to a disability or perhaps a caring responsibility. And I'd suggest get in touch with the trust to discuss that, um, if you like, uh, before you put your application in, but we can certainly um, provide alternatives to physical travel uh, quite easily now. And for people living in remote parts of Australia, we are going to be allowing domestic travel uh, to recognise that um, in some instances, people haven't had the opportunity to travel within Australia to really learn, and there's still a lot to be gained for their communities um, through domestic travel. And Churchill Fellowship is an individual project, it's not a team project. So really there can only be one person applying for and receiving the Churchill Fellowship on your topic, not a group of people. Uh, so keep that in mind um, if you apply. Now it is possible to take someone with you under certain circumstances, but they won't be the Churchill Fellow. Um, an example would be a good example from a couple of years ago, a Victorian Churchill Fellow, uh, his project was specifically looking at um, Indigenous um, fire management techniques and he work, works for a uh, rural fire organisation and they actually paid for one of the um, Indigenous employees to travel with him and that made a lot of sense in terms of the work they were doing collaboratively and, and that did pay dividends for them but of course the applicant um, is the Churchill Fellow in that case. And I really um, hope that what you hear today uh, is that a Churchill Fellowship is an opportunity for people from all walks of life. And that's a saying that gets bandied around quite a bit, but for this organisation, it really is our mantra and we do mean it. So the projects that you can do really are very, very broad. Uh, it's essential that whatever the project is, there is some benefit to the Australian community in you coming back and sharing that knowledge. You really need to demonstrate that you've uh, fully explored your topic or your issue within Australia and that you know what's happening here in Australia and you've identified opportunities overseas where they might be doing things a little bit differently uh, or better in some cases uh, and you want to go and find out more about that. So you do need to convince us. If we think that you, know, you could travel um, around the corner and find out information on that topic and you just haven't done that yet, then you're not going to get through because it's a very competitive process. The project must be uh, self-contained. It can't be part of a university degree that you're undertaking. If you're at university, it can't be partly funded by another organisation. You know, we're not the external travel budget um, department. Uh, the reason for this is that we need you to focus 100% on the Churchill Fellowship opportunity. Um, that's the most important thing. Uh, it doesn't need to relate to your employment, but of course, for many people it often does because they're working in an area that they're passionate about or perhaps they became passionate through their careers. It doesn't matter, um, but you don't have to relate your project to your employment. We don't set limits on the topics or the issues and that really is one of our strengths. So the beauty of a Churchill Fellowship is that you can design your own project. So we don't tell you what to do. We don't tell you who to see. 
Um, if you can think of a suitable topic, then there really are no limits. Uh, we do offer some sponsored fellowships. I mentioned earlier in terms of the finances, we do have some organizations and generous individuals who donate money to the trust um, to see church or fellowships on particular topics. Um, relevant to this session um, on agriculture, we have a brand new fellowship, um, the Saskia Beer Church or Fellowship uh, for Innovation in Food Production uh, or farming. And so we're looking for passionate food lovers to pursue innovative, artisanal, sustainable, regenerative, and community focused approaches to food, food production. Uh, another one is a Jack Green uh, Fellowship. Uh, and Jack Green used to work in the dairy industry. Uh, Tim Roche, one of the speakers tonight, uh, actually was awarded a uh, Jack Green Churchill Fellowship, and that's for projects that relate to the dairy industry, obviously. And the third one I thought I'd mention is the horticulture innovation. It's, it's not obviously agriculture, but there are some people here that I'm sure are working in or interested in horticulture. And through that partnership with Hort Innovation, um, we're offering fellowships uh, on topics that are relevant to horticulture. So if you have a look at our website, you'll be able to find all the different sponsored fellowships available. Uh, by applying for a church or fellowship, you're automatically eligible for a fellowship. Um, you don't get ruled out if you tick a box um, identifying you're interested in a sponsored one. You may get the sponsored one. You may also be awarded and not get the sponsored one. So don't be afraid to have a look at those opportunities. You do have to apply um, online. So applications open today and they close on the 28th of, of April. Uh, go to our website, churchwellfellowships.com.au and you'll be able to find all the information you need, including the application form. Um, you can save your application and come back to it. I would recommend you do spend some time uh, refining your application. People who um, have received fellowships always say that the whole process of writing the application was, was really valuable and helped them to still their thinking, get really sharp about what it is that they, uh, that they wanted to do. So um, you will need two references, a, a reference uh, who can talk about you, the person, and your attributes, and a referee who can also talk about uh, the topic or the field or the issue that you're doing. So someone with some expertise and credibility. Um, my advice there is get on early to identify those referees, check that they're willing to do it, make sure they're going to be available. Back before COVID, the big problem was people be on overseas holidays and they couldn't get hold of them. So right now, it's not a bad time to get hold of those referees because they're probably at home like most of us and, and they can spend some time preparing your reference, which they will submit um, online through the form. Um, with regards to your itinerary, um, you know, be smart about it, be quite focused, I guess laser focused about where do you want to go, who do you want to see, why do you want to see them, because that's what you need to tell us if you get an interview, you need to convince us, um, you know, that you know exactly what you want to do and why you want to do it. Um, we don't let people travel to countries that are listed as high risk and that smart traveller says don't go to, so keep that in mind as well, that can change over time, so if things do change, in the time it takes for you to get your fellowship and travel, obviously we can make um, some adjustments there. You do need to take your fellowship in one continuous journey of four to eight weeks. Some people do choose or elect to um, stay a bit longer. Uh, and that will usually, you know, they fund that themselves. Sometimes that's to do a bit more research. Uh, and other times it's because they want to meet up with their family for an overseas holiday and they're already over there. And that's okay. So we're not, as I said, we're not a government grant. Um, we're quite flexible. If you want to take the opportunity to extend your fellowship and have a holiday, that sounds fantastic to us. Um, we're just not going to pay for your family to join you, but, but you were very welcome to do that. And in fact, some people will take family members or their children with them on their fellowship and say that that's a fantastic experience. Others say they left them at home and that was equally fantastic. So that will depend on your own personal circumstances. Um, you know, I did mention COVID at the start. Um, clearly, uh, it's had a pretty big impact. We didn't run a fellowship round last year for the first time since uh, we uh, came to an existence in uh, 1965, which is a pretty big thing. Uh, but we do have a queue of over 200 Churchill Fellowship recipients getting their bags packed again and ready to go. So we're going to be busy this year. If you're successful this year in being awarded a fellowship, you'll be able to travel from January next year. And I'm feeling pretty hopeful that our international travel experience will be a lot more open uh, by January next year, but I could eat my words. It's been an interesting last um, couple of years, hasn't it? 
Um, just quickly on the selection process, there's a selection committee in each state and territory comprising uh, a member of our board and volunteers who are experts or senior people across different sectors and industries. So keep in mind that um, we might not have someone on the selection committee that knows about your particular topic to the depth that, that you do. And so, you know, in your application, don't use jargon, use plain English, be really clear and assume that the people reading it are learning about this for the first time, whatever your topic is, that is important. Um, in 2020, we held all the interviews like this using Zoom. They went really well, but it's not quite the same as being in a face-to-face -face interview. And I would expect that this year, if um, COVID allows for it, we will have face-to-face -face interviews. But if um, you're unable to attend, we can accommodate um, Zoom interviews as well. Um, so uh, just finally, uh, remember that it is a very competitive process. We, you know, last time in 2020, we had 1,100 applicants. Interestingly, we usually get close to 2,000 people start an application. And we did some research to find out why, you know, a big number of them didn't submit. And the reality is that they just lost their nerve and felt they weren't good enough, which I think is a shame. So if you're a bit like that, don't be shy. You know, you, you've got to press submit to be part of the mix. And um, there's no reason to believe that you couldn't be one of our next uh, Churchill Fellows. So um, on that note, I shall hand back to Prue. Thank you, Adam. That's uh, fantastic. It's great to hear about all of that. And we're about to uh, listen to the first of our two speakers. But before we do that, um, if you have questions for Adam or for either of the speakers, you can submit them via the Q&A bar at the bottom on the toolbar. So that's the way to submit your questions for Adam or Hazel or Tim. Um, if you could direct the question to the right person as well, please, if it's not obvious. I mean, if it's obvious, that's that's okay, we'll work it out. Um, it, it's just going to be a bit too unwieldy, unwieldy to have people ask questions in person or to be putting up their hands because there are so many of you on there. Um, but there will definitely be time at the end of this whole session for me to pose those questions to our speakers. So um, by all means, Pop, pop them in there and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. And if we can't get to them all, then um, Churchill Trust has said that they will, um, you can send questions to them as well and they will, they'll they field, field them later on. Um, so first up, Dr. Hazel McTavish-West uh, is a creative plant scientist and food industry consultant with more than 30 years experience in innovation, natural flavours and fragrances, colours and bioactives. She's also the CEO and co-founder of Seed Lab Australia Proprietary Limited. And I absolutely encourage you to visit her website and watch the videos presented there about Seed Lab Australia and its predecessor, Seed Lab Tasmania. I went down quite a rabbit hole um, having a look at those. I thought it was so fascinating. So Hazel is a food scientist and technologist and actively involved in food innovation throughout the value chain, from primary producers through to consumers. Her work has a strong science core fleshed out with commercial experience and flavoured with a passion for effective communication for concepts, products and people. And you'll hear all about how effective she is at communicating in just a moment. Her Churchill Fellowship examined nimble food factories and interviewed successful innovators, which provided the know-how to develop the unique programs that bring the best brains in the business together to help smaller businesses be more successful than they ever thought possible. Take it away, Hazel. Well, thank you for that, Prue. Amazing uh, introduction. Uh, I'll share my screen and get on with the show. Start my timer. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And off we go. So I was lucky enough to have a Churchill Fellowship in, awarded in 2017 for travel in 2018. And I went to look at how to get more fruit and vegetables into value-added foods. I was, um, as Prue's outlined, I was heavily involved in the vegetable and the fruit industry nationally and I've had a long history in the UK. And I've specialised all my career in all the things in plants that make them amazing, the flavours, the colours and the bioactives. It's all the reasons why you need to eat your fruit and at least five serves of veggies a day or better still, 10. 
I do a lot of new product development and working in packaging and marketing and working with industry to help them innovate. And I've been working with agribusiness nationally as a consultant for about 18 years when I applied. And this was a really big deal for me. And I didn't realize that until I went to the national convention shortly after receiving my award, where I found out it was far more than just uh, 10 weeks of travel uh, or eight weeks, uh, and it was a huge deal and a huge responsibility. So I then took things very seriously. And I was a consultant and still am. So I had a little moniker for how I was going to communicate that and got some little um, things generated to help me bring my pictures of products to life. And I uh, helped traveled under the moniker postcards from the veg doctor. Now I am an overachiever, overachiever in everything I do. So I did 10 weeks of travel because there was conferences at either end I wanted to go to. And I've listed here all the things I did while I was there. And I guess one of the biggest things for me was 5,700 photos, which I then had to um, give due, due justice to in my report. I just wanna say a big thank you to the Churchill Trust for this amazing, unique opportunity you will not get anywhere else. So um, I found unexpected things. I thought before I went, I would know what I was gonna see. And it wasn't quite like that, uh, which really made me stop and think. Now, I was looking at fruit and vegetables, and one of the first questions when I talked to some of the factories and the growers was, how do you get more efficient at what you're doing? And one of the major lines that came out was, well, get the right varieties that are fit for purpose. Maybe they're, they're, they're designed of a certain shape to reduce waste, they improve efficiency, they suit value adding, or they've got a better shelf life. And here's John Rayner with his tomatoes, which because of their very nature, have reduced his complaints and waste from soggy sandwiches at Rainer Foods. I looked at snacking and that was a big trend. These are huge buckets of cherry tomatoes and, and varieties that are already small, which means they don't have to be sliced and diced so they have better shelf life. But what I also saw was huge in-store placements, which meant that people bought a whole lot more and ate a whole lot more. I was looking at urban production, which is, uh, you've got to remember this was four years ago now, so it's a lot more trendy now, but supermarket rooftops and disused railway tunnels and retail cabinets in shops were being used to grow produce to help people, uh, consumers connect with the food, but also help the company with their PR. Look, we grow fresh, therefore we are fresh. I discovered nimble factories. Now, one of the reasons I went is that a lot of the vegetable industry were hearing, look, there's this new piece of equipment that's $20 million and it's just what you need. And I just wanted to strategically look bigger than that and see, is this the case? And I found everywhere I went, nimble factories where people were doing things by hand. And these people are getting paid just as much as people in Australia were um, you know, in, in a good job. So they were using people who are nimble, who can do one thing one day and another thing the next, which was re required for the pace at which change happened. They were using tried and tested equipment, using traditional pasteurization and hot fill rather than you know, the new thing on the block looking at different processing options to turn vegetables into a whole heap of different shapes, which meant different functionality. So, you know, the butternut pumpkin was being turned into probably 20 different shapes in one factory, which meant that it could be used for lasagna sheets or chips, which also meant people were eating loads of butternut pumpkin, probably more than we do here now. I was traveling when plant-based foods were really starting to take off. They're pretty much mainstream now, but I was looking at all the different categories they were in and the ingredients they were using. And the thing that shocked me or surprised me, I guess, was the country relevant products. So in Italy, I actually saw some of the biggest range they're a country that love their veggies, but they also love their meat. And here we've got a plant-based salami, which is made from something very different to what they're used to. Looking at packaging and how things were being presented. And again, we've moved on a lot since then to more sustainable options and paper and cardboard, but there's still some craziness even now. And I saw everything from this to individually shrink wrapped carrots. Yes, it's true. Um, Deliver to me was really starting to be the thing. Now, because of COVID, this has really expanded, but we were looking at delivery of everything from ready to cook to restaurant meals. 
Now, what I found with Churchill was it opened doors because I, and I had the confidence to contact people I wouldn't normally have contacted. This is Derek Sarno at Tesco UK, who is, uh, had put Tesco as number one in the UK for plant-based food. And now they're going global and probably will be here before long. The generosity and the openness that people met with me and the long-term connections that I've made as a result of that. Derek's come and talked to us several times as, and since then and will come to Tassie, I'm sure, before too long. So what does all this do? Well, that's my amazing report, which has made the best use possible of six, almost 6,000 photos. But I've been a consultant for, you know, 18 years and so... I had worked with individual companies trying to solve their problems. The Churchill Fellowship let me look bigger than that and strategically at what I thought needed to be done that nobody would individually pay for and yet the whole of Australia needed it. I felt a very big achievement from doing this, not only because it took me to the very edge. It spent three months preparing for it, 10 weeks traveling on it, 10 weeks reporting on it, now, when I was uh, traveling on it, I was also writing this book for Horticulture Innovation, all about vegetable innovations. So I was kind of doing my day job at the same time. And then when I came back, I, because of that project, I traveled all around Australia sharing about vegetable innovation with the vegetable industry. But I had all this news and all these pictures from my Churchill Fellowship, which I was still trying to consolidate into a report. And that in itself was a really big thing. And um, so actually get everything done on time was fantastic, but it took a lot out of me. What it gave back to me was an immense confidence uh, that people listen to when you question things they're doing because of what you've seen. You will think bigger after doing a Churchill Fellowship. There were some unexpected outcomes for me. One of which was I felt incredibly lonely when I was traveling on my own for 10 weeks. This is my youngest daughter, Rona, who is a complete superstar. And when I picked myself up uh, six months after getting back and started back on my consultancy with no clients and no income coming in, what am I going to do? And I, so I went back to my core, which is all the things in plants that make them amazing. And I put a tweet out and something on LinkedIn and said, I'm going to go back and remind myself of what of all the new science around this. And my daughter said, we can make a zine about that and I'll do some paintings. So she did, this is her first painting of a beetroot. And we put that zine together to get, which was a fantastic first for us. More to the point, power of a goal, that signature on the front of the one she's holding is Jamie Oliver. We, we had a power of a goal to get that to him at a, an appointment at Woolworths. Which brings me to my next thing. Seed Lab Tasmania, which has been a two year project now complete and we're building on that for the future, which I had no concept of doing before I went, but this bigger thinking and strategic thinking meant put together a program to help over 100 Tassie agri-food startup businesses start, scale and grow to be export ready. And Woolworths are one of the partners in that, that's federally funded. Um, that's been very successful, and that has led to this, which is Seed Lab Australia, which is for 700 businesses nationally and are fully funded by Woolworths. An amazing opportunity to help fast-moving consumer goods businesses grow and an amazing team. And thanks to COVID, we do everything on Zoom now, which has meant we can bring the whole of Australia together, and we do so in forums very much like this. So... Amazing opportunity. I'd like to say thank you for this opportunity. It has changed my life, but I will not uh, mince words. You get out of it what you put into it. And I put everything I had into it and it took me to the edge, but out of that has grown my whole future. So thank you. Thanks so much, Hazel. That's um, it's, it's really fascinating. As someone who has... Um, you know, from day dot with my kids uh, snuck zucchini or beetroot into every cake that I've ever made. Um, I, uh, I fully understand where you're coming from with uh, uh, making, you know, foods more nutritional. Um, I'm interested, uh, what prompted you, Hazel, in the first place to particularly go for a Churchill Fellowship and not do this another way? I'll give you the totally honest answer for that. I thought it was eight weeks of paid travel. <laughs> and I thought that'd be great. Thanks. It's so much more than that. 
I don't think you'd be alone there. And I know, and you did certainly, um, you didn't mince words in your presentation there, but as you say, you, it is, it's not a holiday. It, no. can, it can be hard work. It can be like a lot of things that are really hard work. It's enormously rewarding. But I know that is something that you want to impart is that, um, you know, be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you get very good advice from the Churchill Fellowship Group about making sure you don't plan as many meetings as I had and you do have downtime. And I kind of listen to that. Um, but life happens, doesn't it? And families that you catch up with, stress happens. So my advice would be listen to what they say at Churchill, book downtime and don't go and stay with family. Um, just mm -hmm. get some rest. <laughs> Mm. And uh, um, I'm hoping this is public, but are you you're spreading Seed Lab even f further afield? Oh well, everybody wants a bit of Seed Lab now, so we're talking about going global next. But uh, yeah, That's amazing. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, thank you. And if everyone, uh, as I say, if you have questions for Hazel, and I'm sure you do, then please just put them in that um, Q&A uh, on the, um, the toolbar at the bottom. Just um, connect up that way. And I will ask those questions of Hazel uh, at the end after we've um, heard from both our speakers. Um, okay, thank you. And now we're going to go to Tim Roach. So Tim is the National Milk Supply Manager for the dairy company Fonterra. Um, he grew up in Southwest Victoria on a dairy farm. He's a fourth generation dairy farmer and has always been very much involved in his local community. He's an experienced commercially focused dairy and agribusiness professional with comprehensive supply chain and sales experience in Australian and international markets. Now, Tim's Churchill Fellowship sought to investigate modernizing milk price models and managing price risk for the Australian dairy industry. And he traveled to major developed dairy markets in the US, Europe, and New Zealand. Now, while their industry structures and economies do differ, they have many commonalities in milk pricing and risk management um, that we can actually learn from, adapt, and apply to the Australian industry. Now, this he did this in 2017, where it's when he completed his fellowship. And a few things have changed in the dairy industry since then. Um, but I am super keen to hear from Tim as to what he found, yeah. and if the industry is learning or has learned. Um, so floor is yours, Tim. Thanks, Prue. And uh, hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, Sharon, we can't be here in person, but uh, great to be with you virtually. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully, everyone's uh, Got that now. Bring it back up again. Um, so, look, I was really fortunate. I mean, it, it, it's quite amazing. Prue says it was uh, only, you know, it was 2017. It, it certainly doesn't feel like five years ago. Um, but I was really fortunate enough to uh, receive a, a Churchill Fellowship. Um, and to be honest, to, to really investigate something that's been a really strong interest, a passion of mine for many, many years. And, and today, um, over the next 10 minutes, I'd just like to take the opportunity, I suppose, to tell you that story. Um, uh, you know, what I did, why I did it, uh, where I went, um, sort of what's happened next. And that's certainly evolving a bit like Hazel mentioned. I mean, it doesn't sort of stop. Um, and then some tips and tricks, I suppose, what I learned along the way. Uh, so um, I look forward to sharing that with you. So my topic was all about modernising milk pricing and price risk management for the Australian dairy industry. Now that doesn't sound uh, super exciting, it sounds a bit nerdy, but um, if you sort of, if I can take you back to um, my childhood, I was born on a dairy farm down in Southwest Victoria. So uh, down there in a place called Colac, um, fourth generation farm. Um, and inevitably I was the one who, uh, between myself and my siblings, you know, said no to continuing on a hundred years of, uh, of agriculture and farming at our, at, at our farm. Uh, but I've always been heavily involved sort of from employment, from interest level in agribusiness and agriculture. Um, so for me, dairy is, is what I did. I grew up, you know, my, my jobs in when I was a kid growing up uh, certainly wasn't at, at, at Macca's. It was out milking cows, getting cows in, cutting, you know, uh, silage harvest, all these sort of things. Um, and as a kid, that was awesome. You know, my, I sort of had a thousand acre backyard, um, which was which was pretty amazing. And, and, and from that time on, really, my interest in agriculture has always been really, really strong. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's just a, a genuine passion of mine. But 
as Prue mentioned, you now the dairy industry certainly had its um, its ups and downs, uh, and certainly what, what I wanted to investigate was it at a period of challenge for the dairy industry. So, uh, if you can cast your mind back to around 2016, the industry went through some major changes. Um, you know, there was price step downs. One of the, the sort of the largest processor owned by dairy farmers effectively, um, you know, uh, ran itself into administration over a period of time, uh, and you know, companies, farmers particularly, lost a lot of money. Um, it was very challenging. When you think about dairy, it's a five billion at the farm gate level. So what farms produce, it's about a $5 billion industry in Australia, uh, employing 50,000 people, but the majority of those people in regional Australia. Um, so I've always had an interest in this and it was like, and one of my bits of advice later on, it was just like, well, why don't I try and do something about it over and above what I'm doing? And that's where the Churchill Fellowship uh, popped up. It was introduced to me as, a, hey, here's a really good option. Stop annoying me about, uh, it's just from a former boss of mine about um, you know, making change and, and effectively go and try and do it. So that's what I set out to do. Uh, so on my fellowship, I went through uh, to the yeah, sort of the major um, dairy regions globally. Uh, so yeah, obviously in Australia, uh, then went across to, um, to the US and spent uh, yeah, probably three, about three weeks in the US uh, driving all around there, uh, over to Ireland, uh, then over to the UK uh, the Netherlands, uh, then right back across to New Zealand, uh, and then back to Melbourne again. So just a phenomenal uh, whirlwind, about seven weeks all up uh, to a bit, you know, the, the people, uh, the places, uh, the experiences I had were just, um, they're quite staggering really, um, you know, and, and I couldn't agree more with Hazen, you know, that like everything in life, but particularly this, the more you put into it, the more preparation, uh, the more you, you throw yourself into it wholeheartedly and, and, and sort of let go of any of those, uh, uh, hesitation, you know, the more you get out of it, and it couldn't be true in, in my um, in my experience. Um, it was flat out, but it was awesome. And I did make some time. Um, I certainly took the, the, the advice and had traveled a fair bit sort of in, a, in, in, in my uh, you know, uh, professional life, um, but to have some downtime, catch up with people. Uh, funnily enough, a lot of those people linked to agriculture. So um, it was great. So for me, the highlights, I, um, you know, this phenomenal opportunity um, and one of the things that Churchill does is it really opens doors um, because it is somewhat independent. Um, people are interested and intrigued, particularly where, you know, Churchill's not as well known, such as the US, uh, but, you know, really pushing yourself out of your comfort zone um, to leverage your contacts. Um, and, and what I found as a real highlight is people really wanted to help um, because they could see what you're doing. Um, was really to, to make a better future, ideally. You know, we, we, we want to all contribute in our own way to make a better future. In that instance, you know, mine was, you know, how can I help, you know, the communities where I grew up, um, you know, the people that I know, um, you know, the dairy industry um, to have a better future. Um, and, and, and the topic that I think can help is around this price risk management. So um, definitely a highlight was just, you know, I mean, this is just a subset of sort of the, uh, you know, the dairy farmers, uh, the, the businesses, the banks, the processes, the government institutions, uh, the financial institutions uh, that, that, that make up our um, sort of global sector. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of highlights, you know, sort of sitting in uh, the London Stock Exchange, uh, you know, four or five days later, um, probably having one of the best experiences of the trip, which is uh, sitting down to um, a meal and a few Guinnesses with uh, four dairy farmers in Ireland uh, down in Kilkenny and, and just getting a real sense of what it's like to be a, a farmer and the challenges they face. Um, so for me, you know, there's some of the highlights. I think another one, I've got a couple more, but it's certainly that um, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, um, you know, the ability to grow and develop, you know, personally, uh, but also um, to help, you know, the industry that you work in um, was a real highlight. Um, it doesn't come easy, but um, yeah, I, I found that that opportunity to grow and develop through this process through the Churchill Fellowship as, as just a real a real highlight, um, which enabled you to hopefully and, and what I'm trying to do now is give back, um, you know, to make you know the, our, our industry that little bit better. Uh, but it's not just me, obviously, in this space. There's a whole bunch of us. Um, but what I found you know a real highlight out of this is uh, the, the platform, that independent platform, that sort of subject matter expert platform that this experience, this fellowship really enables is um, is is, is really valuable and a, and, and a highlight. Um, and, you know, I think in my case, um, and I, I sort of uh, made a, a little bit of a joke about this in the, um, the presentation at the end of the, the fellowship, but um, 
you know, I want people to keep eating uh, ice cream and cheese the rest of their lives. And I think uh, if that's one little thing we can uh, achieve out of this, it's great. But, you know, on a serious note, we are making some um, some really good sort of uh, headwinds as an industry. Um, and I see myself as a, as a small part of that. Um, and, and I see the fellowship as being a real enabler to give me a voice, essentially, to, to help in that um, creating a better future for our you know, Australian communities and, and those that are involved directly in dairy and indirectly, because it does create a lot of jobs. And that's sort of the first point. What happened next? A lot of industry and community engagement when I got back. Um, so working with workshops um, at the time, sort of pretty much, but our industry went through a um, some sort of government intervention, if you will. Um, you know, we had a national dairy plan put in place, some new legislation uh, that, that took a lot of consultation. You know, which I was a part of, and certainly this fellowship gave me a, that platform to do this. Um, but the legislature put a mandatory code of contact between buyers and producers of milk. Um, and this dairy plan that ran in conjunction with that, um, I was certainly a part of that consultation. There's also a guest speaker at, at the national forum that was chaired by John Brumby, um, and, and there was five key recommendations. And I suppose really pleasingly um, is, is one of those recommendations um, that's going to take a long time, but was all around price risk management. How as an industry do we do better in this space um, for, the, for the future of our industry and, and the communities that operate in it? Um, so that was a real sort of... Um, Key, key piece, and I'll probably jump ahead a bit, but one of the other key bits, um, what happened next was the report. I'm going to be straight up here. I really, it, it, it was sort of triggering for me uh, having to write this, uh, you know, very detailed long report. It's not a strong suit of mine uh, and it took me back to my uni days and uh, and school days and, and Emma and the team will know that I was probably a little bit uh, tardy in getting it done, but it was one of the best things I did when I actually knuckled down to do it. It really consolidated um, a lot of the views and sort of my hypothesis around what needs to be done or, or, or what could be done to help in this space. So the report was a massive task for me, but it was uh, yeah, highly worthwhile. Um, so the Australian Dairy Plan, which I mentioned before, that's ongoing, um, but it's a, a whole of the industry, whole of government across Australia plan around how do we essentially make the Australian dairy industry um, better uh, for the future, you know, for that long-term viability of all members in, in, the, in the supply chain. Um, and then of course, last one is sort of on, ongoing pursuit of change. I mean, one of my reckon that recommendations out of the report was, um, you know, an implementation of a price risk management and a price milk price market is probably a seven to 10 year pursuit. Um, you know, pleasingly, there's some there's some really good um, uh, gains being made by the industry, and which I'm certainly an active participant in, but by no means leading, but certainly a, a one of a, a number of strong voices and people got experience in this area. So, for me, it, it doesn't stop with a fellowship. It doesn't stop with a number of presentations. But that ability to to give back uh, long term um, and to grow and and, and learn long term. And I think particularly, you know, when I did the report and through that sort of engagement, you know, being involved in panels and um, workshops, is that uh, one of the things I really found was that uh, the value in sharing, um, it, it really shone through. Um, you know, in the past, I've probably been a little bit more, I keep it to myself, that's my knowledge, whereas this, I think, just opened my eyes to, particularly when you meet everyone, how, you know, uh, how generous they are with their time, um, you know, wanting to impart that back to others, um, was is, is something I strive to do now. So that the ability to share and you know the report being the involvement in the Australian Dairy Plan, um, this ongoing pursuit of change and the ability that, well, the sharing and how much value that creates um, was a real sort of a important one for me. And and in terms of what happened next, um, so tips and tricks. Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch, but I've broken them down into sort of three categories: the application, um, then the actual. Uh, the interviews and then then the uh, the fellowship itself. So the application um, couldn't agree more. Um, you know, Adam's mentioned spend time in it, um, but do it. Uh, do your research on on your topic. Be really specific where you can and get great referees. Sort of where people don't um, yeah aren't as familiar with an industry or topic. Having sort of industry you know people that are respected um, you know known or things like that really helps. So doing your research um, definitely uh, is key. For, for, for that um, for the uh, application and being succinct as possible. Um, one of the things that's also happened next is uh, of um, yeah happily uh, volunteered and, and, and take part to this day in the um, the Victorian panel for agriculture and commerce. Um, and it really shines through the people that have done their sort of research, uh, their diligent um, and, and put together a really sort of sharp application. Um, so for the interview, uh, similarly, I mean, I think being yourself and crafting a story is, is really important. And, and from that, your passion will shine through. 
And if you've got that, you've got that really succinct sort of plan, what you want to do, where you want to visit. And remember, a plan's a plan, things change. Um, but if you've got all that, the rest of it will shine through in, in, in your interview. And certainly don't be nervous, be yourself. Um, everyone on that panel, uh, that, that if um, yeah, you're fortunate enough to get an interview, really wants you to succeed. Um, and they love, I mean, it is so, you come away from a day or two of those interviews and it is just uh, an amazing experience and, and it's sort of uplifting to hear, you know, what people are doing and trying to achieve out there to make um, yeah, our country, our community a better place. Um, so yeah, m my tip there is really, um, yeah, sort of be yourself, but, but be prepared and have that story ready, that, that pitch that catches people, um, catches people's attention and, and shows, shines a light into your passion and, and what you want to do. Um, the fellowship, I mean, there's all sorts of tips and tricks. I mean, the best resource is probably our church itself, the foundation, you know, so much experience there and I've seen many people um, through these fellowships. So I think that's certainly one. Um, for me, preparation, preparation, preparation. Uh, once again, not my strong suits, so I force myself to do it. But the, the more planning, um, the better. Leverage your contacts. They were really happy to help you um, and sort of want to. Um, and some of the meetings that um, not only my contacts, but my contacts' contacts were able to open up were just phenomenal. You know, sitting with uh, you know, one of these uh, Texas, Texas dairy farmers who's really an energy farmer that just happens to milk about 150,000 dairy cows on the side. Um, he's got a Marriott on his farm, you know, he's got JVs of Coca-Cola and I spent three hours with him. Um, so there's just some phenomenal opportunities, but prepare um, and don't be afraid to ask um, for, you know, for people's help, for people's contacts. Um, Hazel, well done. I took nowhere near 5,700 photos. So my next tip is around sort of thinking about your next steps, whether it's photos, doing the report, um, you know, it's something I certainly could have done a bit better, I think, at the time. Um, so I sort of found myself trying to backtrack all the time. Another great little tip, take some videos while you're away. Um, I did take a lot of videos and just voice them over myself. I was able to go back and sort of retrace those, um, which, was, which, which was really handy. Um, the report, as I said, try and get onto it as early as possible. <laughs> um, wasn't, wasn't my strong point, but uh, one of the most valuable pieces of the actual uh, fellowship itself was for me finishing the report. Um, and then, yeah, be flexible. Um, there's some great travel stuff out there, um, whether it's sort of Airbnb that allows that flex. Um, I did take up the opportunity. My wife came and visited and spent uh, about two weeks. She also spent time visiting her sister in uh, Europe at the time. So that was great. Um, and don't be afraid to have some fun along the way. I think it, it helps with that downtime. As I said, I was fortunate enough to have a few friends that do work in dairy in Ireland and you know, as an example, but also in the USA. And, you know, we had some great catch up. And you also, that's where you pick up contacts and other meetings and things like that from. Um, so I think one last thing, um, and the final piece of advice, I think uh, Adam touched on it and his words were just do it. Our minds on a very similar lines and that's just say yes. Um, if you've turned up to this uh, virtual um, sort of showcase, you know, this intro, um, you're partway there go away, do your work, refine your application and go for it. Um, and I think, you know, you certainly won't regret it. And, you know, I think there was one person who had three interviews um, and they got a fellowship last year. So don't give up, keep saying yes, because if you've got a passion for, for something that can help um, uh, our communities, you know, Australian industries, um, go for it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. That's fantastic. It looks windy where you are. <laughs> uh, there is a bit of a breeze. I'm actually reporting from head office. I'm in Richmond in Melbourne, so it's a little bit breezy out the back. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I should be yeah. on a dairy farm somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's all right. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm recording from the Adelaide Hills and it's uh, equally windy here. So, yeah. yeah um, so I guess uh, the same sort of question to you just first off the bat, as I did um, for Hazel. What, why Churchill? Why did you go that way? Yeah, I... Um, I, well, matter of factly, um, my, my boss at the time has sort of become a bit of a mentor as I well now. She was the one who mentioned to me, so I actually wasn't aware of the, the, the foundation. I've since made a lot of people aware of it, but um, I wasn't aware of it. Um, and she was the one who badgered me and said, well, stop badgering, you know, bugging me about this, do something about it. You know, you've got a passion for this. Um, and I think she actually met with Adam on a bunch of other things. And she said, look, you should apply for it. And there's actually a dairy scholarship. So sometimes it's what you don't know, um, but when you do know, and I was like, oh, great. So I got all fired up and then, I was one of those people. I started an application and didn't quite get around to finishing it. And then once again, Mary bugged me. So I said, get it in. Um, and I did. And it sort of went from there. So um, having a passion for something and then getting prompted. So I encourage everyone to, to just apply and or tap other people on the shoulder to do it. Um, because 
sometimes we all need a bit of a prompt um, to, to do these things. And then you, you talked a bit about how you're a bit of a procrastinator and it took you a while to get the report um, sorted. How long does it take? Like what if people were planning that part of the process uh, at the end of you know, their travel, how much time would you say they should put aside for it? Yeah, um, great question. I mean, everyone's going to be different, yeah, but I think for me, I sort of, whilst I'm procrastinating, I, I also have a lot of, you know, you, you then, you're putting out there something that's got your name on it. Um, so, you know, you want to be really, um, yeah, really proud of it, I suppose. So for me, it certainly, I probably, I did procrastinate at the start, no doubt. Um, I probably wasted, you know, a good six to eight weeks, maybe more. Um, but then when I buckled down, sort of a lot of late nights, that's the way I do things, I'm a bit of a crammer. But I think, um, look, it probably took me a good six weeks by the time, you know, draft it up prepare it, draft one, draft two, get some other industry eyes over it. Um, and then, you know, sort of final prep and draft because what you want to put out there is, is, is that legacy, I suppose, of, uh, you know, what's there. Because I know when I did some research, I went and looked back at other people's reports before I applied. Um, and they're a great tool. They're a great resource. And probably another tip is to go and check out some other people's um, uh, reports because you get a good insight around applications and stuff like that. But yeah, I reckon a good probably six to eight weeks, if I was having a guess, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you, um, and while I'm asking these questions, if anybody else who's listening um, wants to get on and, and post a question, please do. Um, you know, now's the time. Um, we can be here for, you know, as, as long as it takes pretty much um, to answer those questions. Um, so please do that. Hazel has been uber efficient and she's been answering them actually <laughs> as they've come in. So some of those I'll actually go back over so that um, in case you're not seeing them, uh, the answers in the question and answer, um, then um, they can be answered actually in person. Um, so one, the other thing, and I hear this a bit about people who are Churchill Fellowships, Churchill Fellows, is the fellowship. And the fact that you interconnect with with others who have probably done completely different things um, is has that been a part of um, for both of you actually has that been a part of what has happened since? Yeah, I mean for me, I'll go. You know, I'll go on mute, Hazel. But uh, the certainly I've connected up. But oh, to be honest, I just take a broader interest in other areas that aren't sort of what I specifically do, like. Um, I remember uh, Raph Epstein went through in the same sort of years years um, I did, and uh, you know at the time I still remember it vividly because it was all around uh, fake news, and I mean what a topic that turned out to be. So for me, it is a real eye opener, and I love it because it's just diversity in terms of what I do day in day out. Um, the Churchill is, is just so varied in its uh, in its approach to um, well the fellowships and the people that are involved. So. Uh, definitely. Um, and the only other one I'd mention is it certainly helps link up with other similar programs as well. I know we're here to promote Churchill, but that ability, vice versa, um, for say, you know, in my industry, say a Nuffield Foundation or something like that, it's on equal par sort of thing. So I think it's a, a great opportunity to our network and also diverse, uh, diversify interests for sure. Yeah, good point. And what about you, Hazel? Have you found that it's connected you with other people either within your industry or area of interest or not? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that came from the very beginning. We, I was very lucky that we had our biennial conference in Canberra about a month after we were awarded and it was on a university campus. Now I used to be in universities, but now I'd been self-employed for a very long time, focusing on vegetables for a very long time. And in that weekend, I met people who were teachers and artists and musicians and fireys and people working with extremely challenging um, situations. One fe fellow had been to look at best practice in psychiatric prison hospitals in America. And I just could feel my brain expanding. And uh, I then, after I came back, uh, got involved in the Tasmanian chapter, if you like, of the Churchill Fellows and to, to give back any more, some more. And we organised our conference down here. And again, the same thing happened. It's an amazing opportunity to meet people from all walks of life who are all very passionate about what they do. Mm. Um, now, I'll, I will go start going through some of these and we might get Adam on as well, um, because uh, the first question I'll actually ask is actually of Adam. And I, I imagine there's probably a bit of this, people thinking, oh, you know, I've never been to uni or I haven't got an academic background. Um, so the question is, would you be prepared to offer any thoughts on the perception that quite a few of the previous fellows 
um, have been have had an academic background and their projects seem to be more suited to a sabbatical um, that should have been funded by their employee employer I think they probably mean um, I know of several academics whose fellowship was awarded to further their academic work this person says and it's anonymous yeah look uh, it's a great question um, look it's something that 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 does uh, have my attention uh, you know I do count the PhD each year when we award them, very um, conscious that we don't um, have an imbalance there because we're not uh, in an academic scholarship. That's not what we're about. We, you know, we can't turn our backs on the amazing career researchers and, and academics we have, of course, but we, we need to ensure there's a balance. And I think you know, there is a perception in some years, even within our own organisation, we think, oh, you know, I think is, are there too many academic research is in there and and you know I'm comfortable that there's not but certainly the perception is something that uh, you know I've got to be careful to manage uh, I can say quite comfortably you know the selection committees will ask the question I certainly do at the interviews I attend when I see someone that's uh, received you know a couple of million dollars in research grants over the last couple of years like why are you coming to us for a twenty eight thousand dollar you know, church of fellowship it's it's change you, you've been so successful in getting all this research money we do ask those questions you know sometimes the answer is as simple as look um i'm prohibited from using that funding to research this topic and use it for travel i can't go and meet these people and do it and you know sometimes that's quite a compelling argument so you know i think it's it's got to be a, a a healthy balance um you know, our office is located in the grounds of the Australian National University, and that kind of kills me. You know, it, it's a great place to be, but it also sends that perception, oh, so you're an academic scholarship. Well, you know, we're not. So I would make that really super clear. Um, if you are not an academic researcher, if you're someone that's working on the land, I mean, we award fellowships to, to people really, you know, from anywhere. And, you know, I immediately thought of someone like um, Emma Robinson from Queensland, um, who, who you know breeds beef um we've got people that actually that they, they, they're on the coal base doing the jobs uh working in the areas that, that they're doing their fellowships in and i acknowledge you know, it can be difficult for people if you're running your own business you know how do you find time to take four to eight weeks you know to go overseas and that's part of the reason these fellowships now are as short as four weeks you know we're trying to make it accessible to people that can't just up sticks and go overseas and close the business so you know, we, we can offer some support um, where, you know, your family income might drop significantly if you go. Well, we, we are willing to look at that, and we do. Um, and in terms of flexibility and timing, you might say, look, I need to go when it's not peak season for me, um, and I need to fit it in, and I need a bit more time. Like, we're really flexible to, to help you um, do that as well. So I hope that kind of answers the question. You know, I think we get some amazing people uh, including you know professional researchers but we're, we're as I said at the start we're not the overseas travel funding department for a university or for an employer that's not what we're here for we really want people who are passionate about their their project and their issue um, to do these fellowships and um, yeah just don't be put off by that at all and we'll keep working on that perception and I, I suppose you know on the flip side of that do you also uh, get people who think th that this is actually just going to be a holiday um, and this is a, a way of funding a nice overseas trip. Yeah, they don't get shortlisted for interviews. <laughs> it's really competitive and you can tell when you see an application, it's like, oh, I just thought of a great idea to put in an application for this. Like, you're just not going to get through. So if you're just trying to think of an idea now, maybe this year is not the year to apply because you'll know. <laughs> like, you'll know if you've got an idea because you're, you're working hard at it now. Yeah, yeah. And I guess because you had the um, last year, there weren't any, um, there weren't any um, trips. Do you expect that there will be a huge influx this year, uh, or what? What do you think is going to happen? What's the what? What's the early? What are the early numbers showing you? If you uh, well, it opened today, and last time I checked, we had you know about forty people had started an application, oh, wow. which is pretty good. As I said, you know we we typically get close to two thousand people start one. Uh, we had eleven hundred people uh, last time. It was interesting because uh, COVID had just taken hold. And our applications closed in April. And you remember March was when everything was all shutting down. We had a 10% increase in applications. It was 
blew my mind because I thought, why would you be applying for something to travel overseas right when overseas travel is the last thing you want to be doing? Um, so it's a bit hard to predict. I think there'll be a, a, a bit of a um, build up of, of interest. And because you know you won't be traveling till early 2023 at the earliest with these uh, fellowships this year, I think we'll get quite a good field, I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, and just you know, for people who are watching, if, if I'm looking off camera, it's just that I've got a couple of screens set up here. So um, I'm, I am, I'm listening intently to everybody, but it's, you know, off camera. Um, so question for Tim and Hazel, after reflecting on your time away, bringing that knowledge back to Australia and communicating what you learn to industry, what would go, what would you go and do? I think what is meant there is what would you go and do again or research further? Uh, Hazel, what would you do? I don't think wild horses would get me to do a gentle fellowship again. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's appropriate because you get one chance of this. And I think if, if of, of everyone I've met who's done one, they're, uh, they don't need another one. They, they're already moving on and, and creating that in their own careers. So, yeah, no. <laughs> Part of the point of it, isn't it, really, is that, that you do achieve what you want to achieve out of that. And it is a launching pad, I suppose. Yeah, very much so. Fair? Yeah. Mm. What about you, Tim? Yeah, I think I'd, I mean, similar way. I mean, uh, there's some things I'd probably just to fine tune, um, you know, things like the report, doing a little bit more of that on the go. So I'm a bit more prepared. Um, but that's, you know, me in utopia world. I know who I am and I'm certainly not one of those academic researchers uh, and I've got nothing against him at all. But that's, that's you know, I, I, I probably couldn't do one again either. But what I would definitely do is I would, if I had the opportunity again, is I would find some, budding person who's got a great passion for you know for our industry in this instance but any industry um and make sure they're fully aware of this and and, and help them you know to try and uh, be a part um of the Churchill fellowship process because it is such a great opportunity um so i'd see my role thought is you know helping others um, become aware of it and then uh, facilitate you know where possible to, to help guide them through the process because i think it's such a you know it is a tremendous opportunity um but yeah as i said you know whether it's preparing a little bit more along the way um, and I noticed there's another question in there, which we can potentially cover now if it, if it helps. You know, some of the things. Yeah, to, yeah, to I, was, I was about to go to that. You know, what, what was the best way of capturing? Is that what you were about yeah, to Yeah, because I think some of the things that I would do, yeah, they're sort of more tips and tricks as opposed to uh, mm. what I do again. Um, but I think, you know, journaling, uh, once again, it's not something that's strong for me, but particularly you can do it digitally now, whether it's just a little app on your phone, you can do a little voice recording. You sound a bit silly sitting in a car after a meeting, but, you know, just met such and such. These are some great ideas. Go and research this in the. Uh, uh, you know, when you get home and write your report six, eight weeks later. Um, you know, so a couple of those little, I think, tips and tricks um, would be great helping. Um, and then photos. I definitely should have took more photos. I'm not sure if I took that many, uh, Hazel, but uh, certainly I'd, I'd need to take more than I did. Um, so I think there's some of the things that, that I'd do again. Um, but prepare, execute the uh, the program um, and really enjoy it and get their comfort zone. That's certainly my tips there. And Hazel, what about you? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you have to remember, I was looking at food, so there was lots of products to look at. Um, the thing I did, which I think was the one of the reasons it made it so onerous was, um, and I'm sorry if I'm, I don't mean to put anyone off, but, you know, it's led to great things. Um, but after each day, I would sit down and write the notes for that day. And then also my aha moments, what, what, what was the big thing I got out of that? And then I would probably do a social media post about it um, as well. And that helped a lot with my reporting. But what was so big about the reporting was the whole journey had been unexpected outcomes and the same things kept popping up. So actually figuring out the best way to capture that into a readable story that I felt reflected what I'd gone through and gave it, you know, press, you know, I don't know what the word is, enough kudos for me to feel proud about it. I, I wrote my report for me so that I felt proud about it, which is why it took so much out of me, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so now this was, what's the average number of times successful participants have applied before that? So this one's for Adam, actually. Um, yes. Uh, what is the average uh, number of times that successful participants have applied before they are chosen? Uh, this person has applied four times. 
uh, only to discover that higher profile people or colleagues have been awarded the scholarship. Uh, this person says, I was surprised as they were already at the top of their field and had the best contacts. Um, so what would be your answer to that, Adam? Yeah, look, a um, couple of things. So, I mean, the average is probably not that relevant. You know, for every person who applies and gets it the first time, there's someone that maybe applied um, two or three times. It, it's, you know, there's sort of not a science to it. Um, I would say don't be discouraged by not getting it the first time. Um, you know, four times, I guess it depends if it's four years in a row, it's probably time to, to maybe talk to some of the people that got it and sort of get some feedback. What, what, you know, what, what am I doing differently to them? Um, but some people apply, you know, they might apply four times over, you know, several years. And, and um, you know, in terms of uh, something people probably don't know is there's some very high profile people that they've missed out in recent years. I won't name them, but, you know, there were people you've all heard of um, and they didn't get through. So we certainly aren't, you know, just sort of cherry picking, looking for the, the high profile people. And I think similarly to the academic question, you know, we are uh, very conscious um, of, of that balance and trying to look for uh, opportunities to recognise potential. I mean, certainly that's me as, as CEO of the organisation. I would like to, to see us maybe be a bit better at recognising potential in applicants and, and and in that I'm sort of thinking also some younger applicants you know because um, it is a lot easier for someone who's kind of already there to present a compelling case to us and to the selection panels um, and so we are mindful of that and I think um, I don't want people to feel disheartened if you see you know other people getting it and maybe you think you're already kind of there um, we are thinking hard about that um, you know in terms of selection criteria um, you know we're looking at personal and we're looking at the project and I guess in terms of the project you know think about what's really compelling about your project and you need to be able to tell us why now is the right time well you'll be traveling you know next year why is the timing right is there a burning platform is there some some reason um, be really clear on how you know you coming back and sharing that knowledge or implementing something will benefit um, Australia and I think you know the question there <clears throat> excuse me talked about um you know, some of the people who got the fellowships would already have the best contacts. Well, you don't need to have those contacts, but you probably need to know who they are in terms of your application. So, look, you know, you don't need to say, oh, I know this person in Germany and, you know, where they're going to meet with me. We don't really mind at that point. It's like, I know this, this is the organisation or this is the person I need to meet with them. We're not going to expect you to say, I've already got a relationship. That's not, that's not important. In fact, quite often the Church of Fellowships what gets you in the door and gets you that, that relationship. Um, and in terms of, you know, the, the, the personal aspect of, of the assessment process, you know, you need to convince us, you know, why are you? Why are you the right person to, to do this and to come back and implement change? And one of the good ways to do that is to think about how you'll do something with that knowledge that you bring back. And, you know, don't just say, oh, I'll write a journal article or, or something like that, because, you know, we're spending upwards of $30,000 on you. Um, writing a journal article is probably not really what we're looking for. Um, just be a bit more thoughtful, I suppose, about how you can demonstrate that you'll, you mean, share that knowledge. And you heard from Hazel and you heard from Tim about the things they've done since they've come back. It's amazing. Um, and they're very, you know, the bar's high, admittedly, but that's what we're looking for is people that can be imaginative and passionate about what they'll do when they come back. So I hope that's that's helpful. Yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, very conclusive. It's You did mention on a, a little earlier in, in your answer there about um, perhaps getting some feedback if you've been knocked back a few times. And one of the questions is about that. Is there any feedback given to applicants who aren't successful? Yeah, look, we don't offer individual feedback. It's, it's purely because we have volunteers working across the country with so many applications and applicants. It, it's a bit challenging. What we have done, and we'll keep building on this, is on our website, there's sort of, I guess we call it generic feedback, like the most common things that people can improve on. So have a look on our website. It's all listed on there. They're fant I can tell you now they are the right things to read. They're the, the sorts of things that come up um, time and time again. Um, you can contact other Churchill Fellows. So if you go to our website and search for people you know, in agriculture or other topics, whatever you're interested in, uh, there's a form on the website. We can put you in touch with someone like Tim or Hazel or anyone who's willing, and, and I've got to say most Churchill Fellows are willing to talk to people and have a chat with them. If they're in your local area, organise a coffee or a Zoom, um, talk to them about your ideas, about your projects. Some people might be willing to have a look over your your application, you can you know send them a draft, and that's a really good way to get some some good feedback as well. And would it be better to another question is to um, would it be better to have 
a previous fellow be a referee or would it be better to have someone outside the, the fellowship? Look, I, I, it really depends on, on the, the um, referee and what the expertise is. So look, we always get, we always see fellows, um, but not, not in every application, but there, there always will be fellows that are, you know, fellows are, are always tapping people on the shoulder and saying, you should apply. We always do see them, you know, you recognise their names in the referee fields, but the vast majority of referees are not obviously Churchill Fellows because of the, the sheer number of applications. So it's not necessarily going to give you an advantage to have a Churchill Fellow, but I think it's an advantage if you can talk to someone who is a Churchill Fellow throughout your application process and just maybe ask them a few questions, get some advice and hints from them. Um, do the sponsored uh fellowships have an involvement in the selection process like would there be subject specialists involved is one of the questions so um sponsors don't get involved at arm's length from the selection process but what we do is if we have one or more people who are recommended by one of the selection committees across the country for a sponsor fellowship <coughs> excuse me um we'll give them the applications to look at and let them decide which one they think is the best fit for their fellowship. But we don't, don't ask them to be involved in the selection process itself. Right, okay. Um, another question, are all applications read by every selection panel or do the state-based panels review the applicants from, from their own state? So um, they're reviewed by the panels in the state. So it's a little bit different due to numbers uh, in every state and territory. So in uh, Victoria and New South Wales um, and Western Australia, they have um, an initial shortlisting process done through specialist panels. So you'll have just people from you know, education or health or uh, whatever the topic is, and they'll do that first shortlisting. They'll get together and, and meet and discuss. And then there's a um, selection committee. There's the next stage, and that has representation from across a broad range of sectors and industries. In the smaller states, like, for example, ACT, we just have one selection panel with a mix of people from different um, expertise, different fields on it, and they'll do the shortlisting and, and interviews. So in Victoria and New South Wales in particular, applicants have to go through two rounds of interviews typically to get through. Um, so it's slightly more arduous, but there's many, many more applicants in those states uh, than the other ones. And as I said at the start, I think you know the best idea is to not count on there being someone who really understands your topic deeply. I mean, some of the medical you know, issues we get on looking at, you know, basal cell carcinomas, whatever it is, you know, you, 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 you know we, and, and certainly I do, and certainly all the panellists and selectors that I know do a lot of Googling and, and ringing people and asking and trying to get information. So they don't just sort of read and go, I don't understand that and throw it out their shoulder. You know, they do a lot of work to understand the issues. And that's where, the, again, the referees are so important because if you've got maybe a slightly obscure or niche uh, topic, having a, a subject matter expert as a referee is so critical to that. Mm. Um, the, uh, one of the things I was interested in is whether you have a quota of certain, so for instance, this is all about agriculture and food production, this particular session. So do you have any kind of quota as to where you will take research projects from in terms of those sectors? We don't, we don't have a quota. We monitor closely each year to make sure that we are getting you know, representation from the broad range of, you know, I guess, high level topics and, and categories as we, you know, we have eight categories that we put things into health, arts, education, et cetera. Um, but we certainly don't have quotas. We don't want to sort of artificially, you know, limit. We want the quality to come through. And look, and from year to year, it'll change. You know, a couple of years ago, education, I think, was quite low. Then the next year, wow, what happened? You know, we, we might put a bit of marketing effort in that area or just through serendipity, we get more applicants or stronger applicants and you see more come through in that that area so where we have sponsor fellowships so of course that that means we're definitely going to be awarding um you know at least at the very least those sponsored fellowships so what i do find is where we have you know great partners like um, hort innovation or or the new um saskabeer fellowship is it attracts you know interest and just by having one sponsored fellowship we get many more applicants and you end up awarding more in that field and that topic anyway and we had a partnership uh, we have a partnership with the National Farmers Federation and it's been a bit stalled because of COVID. And we've got a couple of fellows 
who, who are going to be going back and doing some work with them as part of that commitment to the fellowship. And those types of relationships just continue to build more and more awareness and it just increases the number of um, applications we get in those fields. So that's, that's pretty exciting for us in a new area. Mm. And we're going to wrap up in a little while because we've, we've gone over, but it's been you know, really interesting. And I think people have at least had a chance to sort of ask the questions that they need to um, ask. Um, one of the questions that um, Hazel actually answered in the, um, you know, the Q&A, but written, uh, I might just ask of both Hazel and Tim, because I think it's probably interesting for people who are applying. Um, it's asked what you, would, what you would have changed about the planning stages once you'd undertaken your travel. So once you'd actually started the travel, did you allow enough time for opportunistic meetings once you'd actually met with your sort of target interview? Maybe, um, Hazel. Mm. Yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't have changed anything. I, and I'll be honest, I, I organise things for a living. So I had six A3 printouts of everything I was going to do, even down to when I would do my washing. Um, but, and I and if people changed meetings on me, I often wasn't able to accommodate that. However, that didn't happen very often. I... I, I, to me, that worked because I knew what I was doing and I had my, my agenda and my plan and I didn't want to be pulled hither and thither. But I know for other people, they've got ma ma amazing things out of opportunistic things. It just wouldn't have worked for me with everything else I was trying to do. So I wouldn't change anything. Mm -hmm. Tim? Oh, that's a great contrast and example because I'm the complete opposite. And I think it just goes to show the diversity that, that, that is involved in this Um. You know, I, I had no A3 sheets. Uh, my wife, Hazel, is very much like you. And she's like, where are your A3 sheets? And I said, well, uh, I don't have them. Here's my program. Um, I would say I probably had, before I left, I probably 60% of my program largely mapped out. So I knew all the main destinations I was going to. I had my key meetings in place and I left enough room. So, you know, for example, the one hour slot that I booked in with, um, uh, you know, the big Texas dairy farmer, I could uh, actually spend three or four hours with. Um, and then that led on to, he goes, well, you know, you, you, young fellow, you got to go and meet such and such. And I did. Um, and so I didn't get beat up when things, I didn't beat myself up if all of a sudden I left half a day and I didn't get a meeting then. Um, so I might just go for a drive around the San Joaquin Valley and just see you know, this phenomenal agriculture that's out there. So I think that is a part of the, the growth and development. But, um, you know, I planned, I left a lot of flex, but that's once again, that's probably my personality. Um, I had the first night of accommodation booked in San Fran. I had a bunch of other bits and pieces. Uh, the rest I largely um, did on the run. Um, so, you know, I use things like Airbnb, um, you know, I use a bunch of sort of, you know, travel websites um, and, and it worked really well for me. But I certainly had the bookends, when I call the bookends, you know, the main pieces, main pieces of the jigsaw in place, um, but I was pretty happy with Flex. So I reckon yeah, 60, 60 to sort of 70% of the program was largely locked in beforehand. Um, and if I was to change one thing, yeah, maybe I might book in a little bit more, but on the flip side, the Flex uh, worked really well for me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so don't beat yourself up about downtime um, because there's no such thing. Work on your report or go and catch up with someone socially. Go for a drive around or, you know, immerse yourself in some of the culture that exists, not specifically in your own topics. I think that's one of the you know, things Churchill's really big about is, uh, is, is building, you know, those experiences beyond your specific area of sort of uh, interest or expertise. Yeah, it's great to hear that variety of views. And that's it. Everybody's different um, and they will tackle it in a different way. Uh, but it sounds as if um, for both of you, you, it worked the way that you did it. Um, so, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hazel's got <laughs> questioning it. Um, all right. Well, look, I think, see, a lot of the questions that are, that are coming through uh, are actually on the website. The answers are on the website. Um, and located in the application guide um, on the website. So uh, I would say go to that website, have a look at uh, what the answers are there. And then if you want to contact the Churchill Trust via the website or by phone, then they are you know, more than happy to, of course, answer your questions. Um, there'll also be Facebook live sessions coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, and there will actually be another one of these um, sessions too uh, at the end of February, later on in February, um, looking at similar sort of topic, but not quite the same. Um, 
Also, as Adam said, remember that aside from the general fellowships, there are specific national estate based sponsored fellowships that are being offered this year in a range of fields. And of course, as he also mentioned, um, there is the new Saskia Beer Churchill Fellowship uh, in memory of uh, Maggie Beer's daughter Saskia um, to support innovation and food production or farming, uh, and also then the Hort Innovation Australia Churchill Fellowship to cultivate new ideas in horticulture. Um, so get your thinking caps on. And uh, if you have a good idea, then get your application in between now and April, but a couple of months. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to our fellow speakers today, um, Dr. Hazel McTavish-West and Tim Roach. Uh, and of course, to Adam Davey for providing all the information uh, about Churchill. So uh, I think we'll we'll call it uh, call it there and uh, say good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Prue. Thanks, Prue. Thanks, Emma. Good luck. Yeah, absolutely.